you've been a, a bit of an outspoken critic <laughs> of string theory. <laughs> Maybe one question first to ask is what is string theory? And uh, beyond that, why is it wrong? Or rather, as the title of your blog says, not even wrong. Okay. Well, one interesting thing about the current state of string theory is that it, I, I think it, I'd argue it, it's actually very, very difficult to, at this point, to say what string theory means. If people say they're string theorists, what they mean and what they're doing is a, it's kind of hard, to, it's hard to pin down the meaning of the term. But the, but the initial meaning, I think, goes back to, um, there was kind of a, a series of developments starting in 1984 in which people felt that they had found a unified theory of of a so-called standard model of, of, of all the standard well, well-known kind of particle interactions and gravity, and it all fit together in a quantum theory, and that you could do this in a very specific way by, instead of thinking about having a quantum theory of particles moving around in space-time, think about a uh, quantum theory of kind of one-dimensional loops moving around in space-time, so-called strings. And so um, instead of one degree of freedom, these have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. It's a much more complicated theory. But you can imagine, okay, we're going to quantize this theory of loops moving around in space-time. And what they found is that they is that you could make you could do this and you could fairly relatively straightforwardly make sense of of, of such a quantum theory, but only if space and time together were 10 dimensional. And so then you had this problem, again, the problem I referred to at the beginning of, okay, now once you make that move, you got to get rid of six dimensions. And so the hope was that you could get rid of the six dimensions by making them very small. And that consistency of the theory would require these, that these six dimensions um, satisfy a very specific condition called being a kalabi yau manifold. And that we knew very, very few examples of this. So what got a lot of people very excited back in 84, 85 was the hope that you could just take this um, 10 dimensional string theory and find one of a limited number of possible ways of of getting rid of six dimensions by making them small. And then you would end up with a, an effective four dimensional theory, which looked like the real world. This was the hope. So then there's then a, a very long story about what happened to that hope over the years. I mean, I, I would argue, and part of the t point of the book and its title was that um, you know that this this ultimately was, was was a failure that you ended up that this idea just didn't um, there ended up being just too many ways of doing this and you didn't know how to do this consistently um, that it was kind of not, not even wrong in the sense that you couldn't even pin, you you never could pin it down well enough to actually get a real falsifiable prediction out of it that would tell you it was wrong but it was um it was kind of in the in, in the realm of ideas which initially look good but the more you look at them they just um they don't work out the way the way you want and they they don't actually end up carrying the power or the that you originally had this vision of and yes the the book title is not even wrong your blog your excellent blog title is not even wrong okay but there's nevertheless been a lot of excitement about string theory through the decades, as you mentioned. Uh, what are the different flavors of ideas that came, uh, like that branched out? You mentioned 10 dimensions, you mentioned loops with infinite degrees of freedom. What what other interesting ideas to you that kind of emerged from this world? Well, yeah, I mean, the problem with talking about the whole subject, and well, partly one reason I wrote the book, is that you know it, it it gets very very complicated. I mean, there's a, a huge amount. You know, hu a lot of people got very interested in this. A lot of people worked on it, and 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 in some sense, I think what happened is exactly because the idea didn't really work, that this caused people to, you know, instead of focusing on this one idea and digging in and working on that, they just kind of kept trying new things, and so people, I think, ended up wandering around in a very, very rich space of ideas about mathematics and physics and discovering you know, all sorts of really interesting things. It's just the problem is there tended to be an inverse relationship between how interesting and beautiful and fruitful this new idea that they were trying to pursue was and how much it looked like the real world. <laughs> so there's a lot of beautiful mathematics came out of it. I think one of the most spectacular is what the um, physicists call two-dimensional conformal field theory. And so these are basically 
quantum field theories and kind of think of it as one space and one time dimension, which you know have just this huge amount of symmetry and, and um, a huge amount of structure, which yeah, and just some totally fantastic mathematics behind it. And um, and again, and and some of that mathematics is exactly also what appears in the Langlands program. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the um, first interaction between math and physics around the Langlands program has been around these two-dimensional conformal field theories.